not have been easy. It was a struggle for the 9 a.m. So glad that you're with us. Let's stand up together. And we've come here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to worship the living God together. So let's do that, all right? with 
your life We are here for you Only you We are here for you To your hearts To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden You are our one desire You alone are holy Only you are worthy God, let your fire fall down Let our shout Be your echo You're in now Fill the sky Cause we are here for you Favor rests 
If there's a need in your life this morning that you bring into this room and you want to just be reminded of God's faithfulness, would you put your hand up? And let's just sing this again. God, show your faithfulness, who you are. Let us be reminded of your power, of your freedom, of your healing as we sing this. Oh, God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you. How I need you now He's the rock Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing On your faithfulness Jesus
Oh, the perfect Son of God in all His innocence You're walking in the dirt with you and me And He knows what living is He's acquainted with our grief The man of sorrow, son of suffering Oh, blood and tears How can it be there's a God who eats, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Are distant and removed He chased us down in merciful pursuit To the sinner you were graced And the broken you embraced And in the end the proof is in your wounds In the end Yes, in the end the proof is in your There's a God who leads Oh, praise the one Who would reach for me Hallelujah To the Son of suffering Sing hallelujah, Lord Sing your cross, my freedom your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God.
Come on, let's praise him this morning. Just a reminder in that song that as we suffer, we have a God who knows what it's like to suffer, right? Sometimes you've heard sympathetic high priest, somebody who knows what it's like to face adversity and to suffer. So you're not alone with whatever you're going through this morning. Jesus is here with you. He wants to meet with you, be with you. That's our prayer for you this morning. You doing okay? All right. Hey, we've got kids with us this morning. Kids, raise your hands if you're out there. Come on, I see you over there. We've got youth with us once a month. We love just to have families come together and worship. That's what today is. And let me tell you something, we've got VBS coming up. Kids, are you excited? Let me hear you, kids. All right. Parents, this announcement's for you. On Friday, signups will begin for VBS, and it'll go quick, so you don't want to miss it. Friday, got it? Is it Thursday? It's Friday. Okay. All right. Hey, our ushers are going to come forward, and we're just going to worship through giving this morning. And I just want to tell you something. Um, I love this church. I'm not on staff here, but I get to see a lot. I get to go in the office a lot and just observe our staff Something you should know, you probably already do know this, we have an incredible staff here at Rock Harbor. We really do. And they love you, they pray for you, and right now they're in the process of planning and just seeking God's vision for this church. And it's something that gives me a ton of confidence in giving. I'm giving to a place, a church that I belong to, that I trust in the direction, and I hope you do too. You do, yeah? Come on now, let me hear it. And if you don't, get to know some people because there's really good people here, really good staff leading us and I'm, I'm grateful for it. All right, hey, before the ushers pass the baskets, kids, you can go to the back of the room. Pastor Melissa's there in the back. She will take you. Big kids, say hi to some people around you. Go for it. All right, well, welcome everyone. How are we? Good, ready for VBS? So signups are this Thursday, right, Caleb? Just kidding, they're on Friday. They're on Friday, everyone. Um, yeah, it's great. Uh, out of, it'll be out of this world. Um, so, uh, my name is Braden, and I am one of the pastors here, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Rock Harbor. Uh, if you're new or you've been around for some time, welcome. We're so glad you made it here today. Uh, for those of you online, also, thanks for watching and being a part of this with us. Uh, tomorrow night, we have what's called the intro dinner. The, din the intro dinner is the dinner for anyone who's new to Rock Harbor or just wants to get in more involved and be become part of what God is up to in this place. So we'd love to see you there. Signups are on the app or out on the patio. It's a great way to meet staff, meet other new people, and just get to know people and come be a part. We want you to feel welcome here. And so it's tomorrow night here in this building at 630 tomorrow night. You can sign up online or on the patio. Uh, in, in the song right before the giving and before the transition, we talked about a God who's reaching for us and a God who's reaching for the world. Um, and that's, as Christians, that's, we, we know that God, it's, when we worship, it's never just for us in this room. It's for the sake of the world, for the sake of our friends, for the sake of our families that we care about and we want to see come closer to the love of Jesus. And we have a course here called Alpha at Rock Harbor. And Alpha is a place that we are encouraging you to invite people to that you want to experience the love of God. Alpha is an eight-week course that explores questions of life, faith, and meaning. Uh, we, we ask questions each week like, who is God? 
Uh, who's Jesus? Why did Jesus die? What is the Bible? How do I pray? And if you're in this room and you have questions about faith and you are experiencing uh, doubt or disorientation or deconstruction, uh, we want to invite you to Alpha. And if you and I think all of us in this room have friends that are that are searching, that are asking questions. The ask is that you would also think about those people and invite them to Alpha because it's really a safe space for us to be exploring those questions together. Some dinner, a short talk, and then discussion. Um, but the Alpha, there's really power in inviting and a personal invitation. We can post all we want on social media as Rock Harbor or promote it on the stage, but when we have a personal invitation, it really can do wonders for someone. And so to tell that story, I'm going to invite Carly and Dylan up. So Carly and Dylan, uh, give the hand for them. Oh, well, hello. It's on, yep. It is. Okay. Amazing. So this is Carly, this is Dylan. Um, Carly, why don't you just start with us, uh, how do you two know each other, and then yeah. what was it like for you inviting Dylan to Alpha? Yeah. So Dylan and I have known each other for 25-ish years. We grew up across the street from each other, um, and I actually grew up being her older sister's best friend. Um, and as time has gone on throughout our adulthood and stuff, we just kind of have reconnected randomly here and there, and then about... Six months ago, I moved home from Texas, and as soon as I got home, Dylan saw it on Instagram. I was like, we're hanging out. I've got so much to fill you in on. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of reconnected, and Dylan was telling me about a couple of struggles she was going through in life, and I was just telling her, you know, well, this is what I believe. This is how I believe God works, and just constantly being like, I'm so sorry for shoving my beliefs down your throat. And at one point, she just looked at me and was like, stop. If you know something that can help me, you have an obligation to tell me about that. I believe that that's your responsibility as a Christian is to tell me about what you believe. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, great, sounds good. Um, and then I came to Rock Harbor and they were announcing Alpha at Green Cheek. And I was like, oh, beer and the Bible, this can it get any better? There's no better way to introduce somebody to Jesus. And so I texted Dylan and was like, hey, do you want to go to a Bible study for, with me at a brewery? And she was like, uh, yeah. And so here we are. And Dylan, what was it like receiving an invitation? What was that? How did, how did you feel? And then what did you experience when you got there? Um, it, was, it was awesome. I had a ton of questions. I did not grow up in the faith. None of, neither of my parents had any sort of religious background. But I knew that I believed. I knew that I was praying. But I did not know who I was praying to. Um, so I wanted to know who Jesus was. Everybody talked about how they had a relationship with God. And I'm like, you know, who is that? Like, what is the Bible? I remember being like, what's the New Testament mean? And, and so when we, went to, when we went to Alpha, they answered all my questions. It's the basics. It's like Christianity 101. And when I got there and I had all these questions and without my knowledge, I felt so comfortable with the people in my group, just being able to be myself, be able to tell them what I believed and hear what they believed and then just be in a very comfortable space. So, yeah. Great. Uh, and then what's it like? So after going through those eight weeks, uh, what would you say is the best part of Alpha? I guess the best part of Alpha is the community and just, I guess, the comfort and, and knowing that I am safe in, in the space of Alpha. Um, and also going through it with Carly and becoming a believer and getting baptized at the end of it. Yeah, that's so. incredible. So, yeah, that was, that's, the, that's the spoiler alert. Um, I was going to ask, that's great. What's, so what spoiler happened alert. after Alpha? Like, so you, you two were baptized on Easter, first baptisms yeah. at our Easter services. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, but what, was it, what, what happened after? What's been happening after? Yeah. So Dylan and I, after each week of Alpha, like our conversations didn't just end at the Alpha table. We'd get in her car and drive home and sit outside of my house for an hour. Probably wasted so much gas just sitting in the car, but, you know, the Lord does what he wants to do, I guess. Um, but, yeah, we ended up getting baptized together on Easter in the pool at the same time, holding hands, which was amazing and freezing all at the same time. Um, but Dylan and I read our Bibles together. Uh, about halfway through Alpha, I bought us matching Bibles so we could read the same scripture every day and text each other about what we're reading and what the Lord is teaching each of us because it doesn't just stop at church. He's not confined to these walls. He's not confined to a brewery. He is constantly moving. And it's been so cool. I keep telling Dylan that she should be a pastor, and she keeps telling me that I should be a pastor. And I'm like, well, let's just talk to each other and call it a day. <laughs> so what do you think is the best part? What's been going 
Yeah, so now I go to church every Sunday and I read the Bible and I apply all of the things going on in my life to God. And it's, it's like learning all over again, well, for the first time. Um, so yeah, it's been super exciting to get to know Jesus and God. It's amazing. Um, and this, is, this, this can also be a story of you and your friends and family. Uh, we don't just share because, well, we believe that God's doing something incredible in Carly and Dylan's life, and we want to celebrate that and share that. Uh, but we also want to say this is, this is the model of Christian discipleship. This is the model of what an experience like Alpha can do where we actually get to be on a journey together. What's great is that Carly didn't just hit up some random person she went to high school with, and for the first, like, it was actually out of um, existing relationship that she said, hey, I, I see you, and I see your struggle and I see your questions and I want to bring you to a space. At Alpha, we get to set the table um, for those conversations. And that's really what it is. It's conversation. We have quite people, everyone we believe, uh, Carly, you've shared in the last service that you came with your own questions and explorations. And that's the power of Alpha, that it's not just the people that are seeking uh, and then we Christians have the answers, but we actually get to be a part of a mutuality of conversation together and then actually pursuing truth together. Yeah. So uh, give it for Carly and Dylan's story. And so um, we want to highlight one thing on your, uh, on your seats. This is a uh, card that uh, has the Save the Date for Alpha. It launches May 18th on Thursdays here at Rock Harbor. But then also on the back is the main thing I want to point your attention to. Um, just like we said, we believe that there is a person or multiple people in your life that you've already been praying about. When Easter comes around, I often notice how we start to pray for people a little more intentionally. Of like, I really want them to get, get to know Jesus. Um, let's bring that same energy into Alpha. And it doesn't have to be that you invite them to Alpha. Maybe that's not the right step, but I believe that there actually can be an intentional step that you take towards someone, whether it's texting them, hey, how are you doing? Or just start praying for them in your morning uh, prayer time. And so um, can we do that? So the goal is uh, write uh, someone's name. I commit to intentionally praying for blank and then keep that in your car, keep it on your fridge um, and we'll do that. So, uh, and it's all, it, yeah, it's a, it's a big group effort. So uh, before we transition into uh, our, ser our sermon, I want to pray for the Alpha Course. Lord, we, uh, we believe that you're working. We thank you for the work that you're doing in Dylan and Carly's life. And we ask for more, more of those stories uh, to come out of the Alpha Course. And God, we pray um, for Glenn and the rest of the team as we continue on with our worship and opening God's word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. amen, amen. Thanks, Braden. Praise God. What a great story. I love Alpha. I um, have been familiar with it, was part of introducing it at our church in Colorado about seven or eight years ago. And I, I actually went on one of the trips, you know, Todd Proctor, you may know Todd around here at Rock Harbor, he leads these trips for people to go and experience where Alpha began. Alpha was started at a church in London in the UK, and the guy who created it is a guy named Nicky Gumbel, and I heard Nicky tell the story once of being at the gym, uh, you know, he was playing squash with a buddy, squash, kind of like racquetball, but probably not as cool, you know, and uh, he's playing squash with the buddy and they knew that he was a pastor but of course over there that's called a vicar and so he was Nick the Vic and so his friend who's not a believer was chatting with Nicky and he goes hey Nicky I hear you're a vicar and he goes yes I, I am and he goes well how many people go to your church you know and he goes Nicky's trying to be humble you know he's like well it's, you know it's probably about you know, a few thousand. He goes, how many? It's 5,000 or so. And the guy goes, Jesus. And Nikki goes, that's why they come. Like, that's exactly it. I know you're like a little worried about the irreverence, but Nikki told that story, so I can tell it too. Uh, but it is, great. it is great because it is Jesus. And it is Jesus who draws people to himself. It is Jesus who allows us to, to turn every conversation toward the good news, even a conversation moment like that. But it's also what we're talking about today. We're in this series called We Believe, and we've been tracing through the outline of Christian faith. What is it that Christians actually believe? And what we're using as our guide in this series is uh, an, an old confession of the faith called the Nicene Creed. And it's called the Nicene Creed because it was written together by 300 plus Christian leaders in the 300s. Christianity had been going for a couple hundred years. It had been spreading churches all around the, the Roman Empire, and they decided to say we need to, to convene together and write down, solidify what it is that we've been teaching and we believe. And so this creed was written down and we've been working through it. And in the first week of this series, in the first week of the series, we talked about those very first three words, we believe 
in. And we had a rope that connected from the back of the room all the way here to the front to say this creed is a reminder. It's our connection back to the start of the story. We're not the first ones. We're not the only ones. We can find our way home just like the farmers in those Midwestern blizzards could find their way home because of the rope. And then last week we talked about the first stanza of the creed, which was we believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, and we talked about what it looks like to put our faith in God as the source of everything, a God as the one that, that is the, the maker of all things, what it means to put our trust in this God, and then today we get to the second stanza, and it's all about Jesus. In fact, the stanza about Jesus is so long that we're actually, for our purpose, we're going to break it up in a couple of weeks. So we'll do part one on Jesus. Jesus today. We'll do part two on Jesus next week. Uh, about a decade ago or so, some computer programmers put together an algorithm to look at all the different names that have been searched, and based on search histories and other uh, aspects of this sort of online database, they were trying to answer the question, who is the most influential person in history? Who's the most influential person in history? And so they came up with this top 100 list. Now, I have to tell you, Justin Bieber does not make the list. Elvis Presley does at 69. Winston Churchill at 37. Benjamin Franklin at 35. Go America. Ronald Reagan at 32. Plato shows up at number 25. Julius Caesar at number 15. But guess who shows up according to their algorithm rankings based on search, searches and all this stuff, who the no most influential person in human history was? Jesus. It's Jesus. Now, this isn't the kind of thing that you go, yeah, chalk one up, win for Team Jesus. It doesn't prove anything, you guys. But it does remind us that everybody is trying to grapple with the question, who is Jesus and what do we do with him? There's no serious historian who denies that Jesus, this person, actually existed. In fact, any historian, secular or, or Christian, would say, no, 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 there was a guy 2,000 years ago named Jesus. He lived, he was crucified by the Romans, and a movement started in his name. This much is verifiable and accepted across the board. But we've got to do a little bit more than that this morning, and we want to know, but what is it about him? Some years ago, Time Magazine said that Jesus is the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness, and love in human history. But is that all Jesus is? A symbol of love, a symbol of purity or humility or selflessness. Who is this Jesus and what does that mean for us? I want to offer three reflections from the first part of this stanza about Jesus. And the first line of the stanza opens this way. It says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. We believe in one Lord. You remember last week it said we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, and now they're saying one Lord. And this is an interesting thing because Christians, they're running, the early Christians are running up against the limits of logic and language, and they're saying one God, it's not two gods, and yet somehow Jesus is connected to, is himself the Lord. And I want to just point out something about each of those three words, Lord, Jesus, and then Christ. Lord... Uh, it, it is in the Hebrew, it's the word Adonai, but actually in the Old Testament, they would say Adonai whenever they saw this other word written. And the written word that they would see was four letters, Y, W, oh boy, never do, never do math in public, never try to spell in public, Y, H, W, H. It's the name we pronounce as Yahweh, but they wouldn't let themselves say that name because it's too holy. So every time they, they, they read Yahweh, yod Hey vav Hey, they would say Adonai instead. And then it, that made it over into the Greek, and so the Greek word for Lord is the word kurios. And so they would say it of Jesus. They would say, he's the Lord. He's the sovereign one. He's the sovereign one. And, and, and in their minds, they were saying something that they couldn't quite explain, but the sovereign covenant God, Yahweh, and Jesus. Jesus, they're the same. And they couldn't explain it. But there's another reference here, and that is the word Lord was also used by Romans. It was used by Romans of Caesar. And so Caesar Augustus called himself the Curios, the Lord. And it's amazing because these early Christians are ripping a title from everyday life, and they're saying, mm, he's not really the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. And then the second 
word of, of this name, Jesus. Of course, his name actually in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is what we, would, we say, we pronounce it as Joshua. But Yeshua in Hebrew means the Lord saves. So if Lord is about the sovereign one, Jesus is about him being the saving one. Are you with me? The sovereign one, the saving one, and then you get to Christ. I've said this so many times here already in the short few, you know, time that I've been at Rock Harbor, but Christ was not Jesus' last name. Like, if Jesus applied for a driver's license, it would not say first name Jesus, last name Christ, son of Mary and Joseph Christ. You know, it was not that Christ was a title. And the Hebrew of this is the Messiah, the Greek Christos. It means the same thing, the anointed one, the anointed king. Yesterday, did any of you get up at 3 a.m. and watch the coronation? Some of you did, of King Charles III, or you're like, no, why would I do that? That's right, you're Americans, you know? Why would you do that? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but if you had seen glimpses of it, there's a moment where they take Charles behind a kind of enclosure, and they anoint him. And this is a long-standing tradition that to be a, the anointed one is to be the king. And so if we're putting this together, what are the early Christians saying? They're saying, we believe in a sovereign, saving king. For our purposes this morning, we'll sum it up this way. Number one, Jesus is the only saving king. This is the heart of the gospel proclamation. What is it that when we say the gospel, preach the gospel, what are we centering and orienting our lives around? We're orienting it around this proclamation. Jesus is the only saving king. Do you know what the word gospel means? It means good news. And we hear that, we're like, oh, good news, that's great, it's good news. That word, euangelion, the word we translate for gospel, that word was a word just used in the Roman Empire. It was a street word. It was not a religious word. It was a word from public life, euangelion. And euangelion was the word that just meant good news, good news, good news. In fact, there, some historians have discovered an inscription made in kind of the far reaches of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor where they made an inscription to Caesar Augustus and they called him their savior and they said his reign is the beginning of the good news. Now, isn't that interesting? They said, this is an inscription to Augustus, the Savior, and this is the, his birth is the beginning of the good news. Well, that's interesting because Mark's gospel, Mark 1, verse 1, starts out this way. It says, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ. Wow. It's like they ripped a headline, a, a political propaganda statement from their day and said, yeah, not true of Augustus, totally true of Jesus. They were using street words, but here's, here's I think when you, when you recognize it that way, gospel sounds so churchy and Christian, but you say good news and you associate it with kind of their context of their day, now all of a sudden it makes lights come on, doesn't it? Because the gospel is not good advice. And maybe that's what you thought. You kind of grew up around church and you're like, well, I just go to church because I want to learn how to live better and I want to learn how to be a better person and I got to be a better wife and I got to be a better husband and I want to be a nicer person. So I just want to go because your impression is that this Christianity thing is about good advice. But I'm here to tell you this morning that this Christianity thing, thing is about good news, not good advice. It's an announcement that Jesus is the only saving king. In fact, when you look at one of the first sermons, I think the first sermon after the resurrection, it's in the book of Acts chapter 2. Peter is preaching in Acts 2 verse 36. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, there's that name, this Jesus, he's made him whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, or in some translations, both Lord and Christ. There's the naming of him. And then when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And this is the moment we're at this morning. You're like, Glenn, great. Jesus is the only saving king. What does that have to do with me? Peter's like, glad you asked. Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The only response to the good news, to an announcement about a king, the only response to an announcement about a king is allegiance to the king. That's the only response. 
You know, if you were following the coronation news, you might have heard that a line was added in there for the people to pledge allegiance to Charles. And it became such an uproar, people were like, how do we, in today's world, we'll never pledge allegiance to a king, you know, even the, you know, British citizens. And so the, the line gets changed at King Charles's request. It gets changed to the people will sort of willingly give homage to, like, sort of honor the king. And it's great because it is truly offensive in 2023 to think about pledging allegiance to a king. But it should not also be offensive to us to think about pledging allegiance to Jesus. And this is where we get the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who spoke in Acts 2 would say to us, would say to you, and would say to me, how do I respond to Jesus as the only saving king? The only response is total surrender, total allegiance. And some of us, some of us are living our lives with partial surrender to Jesus as the king. We're kind of like, I like it. I want you to take me to heaven. I want to be forgiven. Let's just dip a toe here. Let's just put one foot here. And I like that. Like on Sundays, I, I'm pretty Jesus-y on Sundays. But on Monday, I live in the real world. And if I want to live my life the way I want to live my life, if I, want to, if I want to have relationships the way I want to have relationships, if I want to spend my money the way I spend my money, if I want to do this and do this, then, then hey man, it's my life. And the gospel says, if there's a saving king, it's no longer your life. Your life has to be turned over to him. And wherever you are on the journey today, maybe you're just sort of dipping your toe in this Christian. It's great. We're glad you're here. But I don't want to bait and switch you. I want you to know that what Jesus wants for you is a place of total surrender. What Jesus wants for your life is total surrender to the saving king, not partial surrender, not a little bit of like a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of that, a little bit of myself, a little bit of my selfishness, a little bit of living how I want. I, I, at some point, at some point... By God's grace, our response to the saving king has to be complete surrender. Amen? Amen? The creed goes on and the rest of the paragraph says, The only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. Now, can we do a tiny bit of theology this morning? Is that okay? I know. It's where you, you, maybe your brains are still waking up. You already had to navigate a detour. Although you're okay. You're smart. 11 a.m. You're like, marathon. I'll just come later to church. That's great. Some of you just went ahead and ran and then came to church later. So good job, Lucas. Um, but we're going we're gonna to look at this and do a tiny bit of theology here. Because here again, we're coming up to the limits of logic and the limits of language. How is there God from God and light from light? <laughs> Here's what we must say and must not say. This metaphor, the use of metaphors here of lights and all this stuff, this comes from the New Testament. It comes from John 1. But the begotten language does not mean created. Begotten is a way of showing the relationship between the Father and the Son, that the Father shares his life and with the Son, and there's a connection there but not a superiority there. In other words, Christians want to be clear that the Father and the Son are of the same essence. They're of one being. They're not two beings. They're not a lesser being. And Christians, it also means, Christians don't believe that Jesus is a created being. So you might have a conversation with a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or someone who's, oh, I, I like Jesus, I believe in Jesus. But when it comes down to it, you recognize that what they believe about Jesus is that he's a creature or a created being, not the eternal one. And so this, this line in the creed, what it's trying to say to us is, number two, Jesus is the eternal son of God. Jesus is the eternal son of God. Now this is going to blow our minds. <laughs> Because it's easier because of the incarnation and because of, we, we, I love the, the, you know, the TV series, The Chosen. We can imagine the incarnate son of God, Jesus, the incarnate son of God, but the eternal son of God, it's how, how do we imagine that? 
I, I'm a parent. We have four kids. I understand that we're always trying to find creative ways of helping our kids think about this. And so sometimes parents will, will do Christmas. They'll do like a birthday thing for Christmas and be like, it's Jesus' birthday on Christmas. I understand. It's innocent enough. But we have to be careful that we don't actually think that Jesus began at Christmas with his birth. He was the word in the beginning. <laughs> the creed says he's God from God, light from light. Through him, all things were made. Christmas is not his birthday. That's not his beginning. He's the eternal son of God. Look at how the New Testament says it. Colossians, Colossians 1, it says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is the first over all creation, because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible. You're like, wait a minute, we said that about the Father last week, right? But it's also true of Jesus. Whether they are the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Wow. And he existed before all things. In fact, Colossians is one of the first worship songs of the church. All things are held together in him. Isn't that an amazing thought? All things are held together. Listen to how Hebrews says it. Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Wow, there it is again. The son is the very radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You know what I think of when I read these texts? I think my vision of Jesus is too small. My vision of Jesus is far too small. Listen, if you want to blow your mind open and say, Jesus, I want to see you in a bigger picture, read John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1. Each of those three chapters, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, those are the passages in the New Testament that make you say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a bigger vision of Jesus than I thought. See, sometimes I think when we're praying to Jesus, we imagine little dashboard Jesus. You know, little bobblehead dashboard Jesus is kind of chilling. And we're like, hey, Jesus, I need some help. And he's like, yeah, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> little skater dashboard Jesus, you know. We're praying to the one through whom the galaxies were made. We're praying to the one, Revelation says, who holds the stars in his hands. The God who by his very word, the scripture says, sustains all things and holds all things together. The delicate, perfect balance that we have even on our planet is being sustained and held by Jesus. This is not little dashboard Jesus. This is not little cute Jesus is my boyfriend. This is not my little cute like Jesus is my homeboy. This is the cosmic, grand, glorious Jesus. Surely the one who holds the universe together can hold your life together. Surely the God who holds everything together by the word of his mouth can hold you together. And maybe this morning that's all you need for faith to rise up in you. To recognize that you're being invited into a story not of a small God, not of a tiny Savior, not of a cute, but of the eternal Son of God through whom all things were made, who sustains all things by, by his word. I, I, I have this hunger in my own heart to say, Jesus, help me see a bigger vision of you. Help me worship you with awe, with adoration, to see a grander, more glorious. The scripture says he's the radiance of God's glory. I don't even know what it's like to glimpse that, but I just want to see it in a wider panorama than I do right now. Amen? And then the creed goes on, this final bit of the paragraph that we'll look at today it says, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. And for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. Now notice something. This is the hinge of the creed. So far, when we've referenced ourselves, what have we been doing? We're just the we who believe. But now, we're referencing ourselves, in, not in first person, but in the third person. 
Something is being done for us. And it says for us and for our salvation. And it says for our sake. Now all of a sudden everything we've been talking about with God, the Father, and the Son. Now it's like, oh, this is for you. This is the part where you come in. I said to you in week one of this series that the, this is not meant to be like memorize these statements of faith. This series is not about a, a statements of faith. This series is about a grand story. This is the moment where we enter the story. This is for us and for our salvation. I have a friend who, um, whose father-in-law is a pretty successful business owner and he said, you know, throughout the years, he, every time they'd get together with the in-laws, the father-in-law just wanted to talk about his business all the time. And my friend was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I'm just getting kind of tired of hearing about all the details of how he built his business and how he runs his business. And it's like, okay, 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 I get it. You're good at what you do and your business is successful, you know. And then he said one day after decades of, of you know, marriage, he, he's having a conversation with his father-in-law. And at a certain moment, the father-in-law says, you know why I'm telling you all this? So I'm telling you all this because you're going to inherit the company one day. And the guy was like, what? Wish I'd been paying more attention. <laughs> you know, I wish I had been paying more attention. And, and I thought about that because that's a little bit like this. Like we just did that little bit of theology. Maybe you're like, cool, like when am I going to use these fun facts to impress nerds? Like when am I going to use these, these, these things, you know? No, 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 no. All of that theology is because this son of God, this savior, this saving king, it's for you. It's for you. You get to inherit this. It reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it again, Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sake so that you could become rich through his poverty. The third and final thing I want to say this morning is that Jesus came for us. He came for us. Last night I was just about to fall asleep and I just started to pray a little bit about the sermon this morning and I saw something, if you could back the slides up to the for us and, our, and for our salvation line of the creed. And as I was just kind of like, you know, thinking about it, you know, in my mind, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit helped me see something that I'd never seen before. There's two names in this paragraph. It's the only names mentioned in the creed other than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The only names. Mary and Pilate. The only two names that show up, show up in the paragraph about Jesus coming for us. And as I thought about it, it struck me. Mary, the peasant girl who represents maybe the lowest end of the socioeconomic scale. A Jewish teenage girl already living under Roman rule. And then you have Pontius Pilate who represents it at not the top, but maybe the upper echelon. And if you're wondering, who did Jesus come for? For both and everyone in between. But maybe flip it. Who is the holiest human that you could think of? I mean, our Catholic brothers and sisters would say, it's Mary. And even if we would answer it slightly differently, we'd say, well, there's something special about Mary's life. Even at the very least, we might say something like that. So put Mary on the top of the human beings to admire. And who would you put on the bottom of human beings not to admire? How about the guy who crucified, who, who ruled that Jesus should be crucified? Maybe we put that guy on the bottom. So you have Mary on the, on the holy list and Pilate on the unholy list. Who did Jesus come for? For both. For everyone in between. For us and for our salvation, for the Marys of the world and the Pilots of the world, for the very bottom of socioeconomic status to the very top, from the holiest life to the unholiest life. It was for all of us and for our salvation and for our sake that Jesus came. Amen? Amen. That's good news. It's really, really good news. John's Gospel, John 1, links the eternal Son of God with the incarnate Son of God. John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. This is why I said John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, they all say the same thing about Jesus. There in the beginning, through Him, everything was made. Then verse 14, 
the word became flesh and made his home among us. What a powerful picture of Jesus, the eternal son of God, yet coming low for us. The other line in the creed, if you'd back up to that slide one more time, the other line that kind of used to trip me up is the very last line for our sake was crucified, suffered death, and was buried. Now, if, you're, if you were an editor you'd, and you were revising this document, you'd be like, redundant, reword. Crucified? Yeah, same thing. Died, same thing. Buried. Got it. Like, why do you, why say it? I think it's because the early Christians wanted us to know that Jesus didn't have a near-death experience. Jesus didn't fake his death. Jesus wasn't pretending. Jesus wasn't Clark Kent pretending to suffer and then, just kidding, I'm Superman. Ha ha, gotcha. The early Christians wanted us to know that this fully God became fully man. And he fully died. He was crucified. He actually suffered death. And he was buried. That means not just that Jesus came to save all of us from the bottom to the top. But it also means that Jesus experienced and entered into every bit of your life and experience. It reminded me of a story. It's a scene from one of my all-time favorite TV shows, The West Wing. Any West Wing fans? There's a scene where Josh Lyman, who's like, like the deputy chief of staff, he's an alcoholic, but you don't know it. It doesn't happen until later in the show. And uh, he has uh, this major relapse, and it only comes out in the course of therapy that he's got a problem. And he doesn't want to admit it to anyone else. And he's in this conversation with Leo, the chief of staff. And Leo, we've known, is an alcoholic. He attends AA meetings and all this stuff. And so he's talking to Leo, and, and he's just having a hard time admitting that he's got a problem. And Leo says, you know, there's a story of a guy falls in a pit, and he can't get out of the pit. He's stuck in the pit. And a priest walks by, and he goes, oh. And the guy goes, hey, help me, priest. I, I'm stuck in the pit. And the priest goes, oh, that's, I'll pray for you. In fact, just writes down a prayer, throws it in there, and goes, here's a prayer. Just pray that three times a day. You'll be okay. It's because I'm still in the pit. And then a doctor walks by and the guy in the pit says, hey, 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 doctor, help me. And the doctor's like, oh, yeah, that looks like it hurts. Here's a prescription, throws it down in there. And the guy's I'm still in the pit. And then one day a friend walks by and he goes, hey, Joe, it's you, Joe, help. And Joe jumps down in the pit. And his friend goes, what are you doing, you idiot? Now we're both in the pit. <laughs> and his friend goes, yeah, but I've been here before and I know the way out. Why does it say that Jesus was crucified, suffered death, and was buried? It's so Jesus could get all the way in the pit with you and with me. He could go all the way low in the place of your shame, in the place of your failure, in the place of your brokenness, so that he could get to the lowest of the low and let you know that he doesn't just know the way out, he is the way out. That's what Jesus does for us. And that means that whatever you're experiencing, Maybe you're experiencing a moment of, 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 of confusion, of pain. You, there's a diagnosis. There's a, your body's breaking down. Your health is deteriorating. And you're like, I'm looking at death in the face. And Jesus is like, I went, I suffered death too. And I went through it to the other side. You say, well, I, 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 it's, not, it's not physical for me. It, it's, it's relational. And I, I've ruined the relationships. I've found myself sunk in this pit. And I can't get myself out. And Jesus is like, I know what it was like to be abandoned by my friends. I know what it was like to be rejected and despised. I went all the way down so that I could save every last one of us. Friends, it's impossible to treat this confession about Jesus as some kind of cold statement of faith. Jesus, the only saving king. Jesus, the eternal son of God. Jesus, who came for us. Would you stand with me this morning? The response for us this morning is probably going to look a few different ways. Maybe for some of you, there was a bit of conviction there about saying, gosh, I haven't really given allegiance to this king and I need to, I need God's grace in surrendering. And maybe for others of you, it's, I just need to see a bigger vision of Jesus. I've had a, my, my panoramic 
view, or my view of Jesus has not been panoramic. It's just been right here, his life on earth, but I haven't even thought about the eternal son of God. And maybe that's just your response today is awe and wonder. But I think for all of us, there's a response of worship and gratitude to Jesus. In fact, we're going to come to the Lord's table today, and I want to invite the people who are serving the, the elements, the bread and the cup, to, to come and take your place and have the elements there with you. We do this so that we're not just talking about this, thinking about this, but literally we're engaging another sense another, of our bodies. We're tasting and we're remembering the eternal Son of God is the only saving King because He came for us, was crucified, suffered death, was buried. The early Christians had a name, had a word for this moment, the Lord's table. They called it the Eucharist. We're doing a little bit of language work this morning. I apologize for that, but, uh, but I, know, I know you're with me. But this word Eucharist just means thanksgiving. Because like really, like well, how else do you respond to Jesus? In the middle of the word Eucharist is the smaller word charis, which just means grace. Grace. Friends, God's grace looks like Jesus. God's grace for you looks like Jesus, the one who came to save, the one who came to rescue, the one who stepped out of the heavens and became fully human. And so this morning as Caleb and Bree and Jack and the team lead us in worship this morning, we're going to come and we're going to receive these elements. But here's what I want us to do is to actually just unlock gratitude in your hearts. Unlock worship and awe and adoration this morning. And so right here in this moment, would you lift up your hands? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, open our eyes again to see you. Jesus, open our ears again to hear your voice. Jesus, open our hearts again to be filled with awe and wonder and gratitude. And Jesus, open our lips again to sing out your praise. Now all over the room, just begin to say your gratitudes and just begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, all out loud, all over the room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for coming to save me. Thank you for coming to rescue me. Thank you for coming into the pit with us all the way down to be the way out. Yeah, let that worship and gratitude continue to rise now as we worship.
That's truly good news, that God is a way maker, that he makes ways, and when, we're not, when we don't feel it, even when we don't feel it, God is working and God is moving. That, that, the, that the sovereign Christ, the, uh, the everlasting Christ came down and moved into the neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson says. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, that's, and we get to actually do the same thing. As we leave these doors, we get to, um, carrying the spirit of Christ, we get to be incarnate presences in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our families. And we get to actually move out into the world carrying the love and good news of Jesus. Um, and if you're coming in today and you, uh, you want to be encouraged and you want to uh, just have someone come alongside you in prayer, you need prayer for anything, we have a prayer team under the screens to my right and to my left. We'd love to pray alongside you and partner in with what God's doing. Uh, second, on the, per on the topic of being incarnate presences, uh, we have Love Coast to Mesa on May 20th. And that's a time when we get to actually partner in with what God's doing across our city. It's a citywide uh, serve gathering alongside other churches, organizations. So Rock Harbor will be at three sites. Go outside on the patio and talk to them about how you can jump in. Alpha's on patio. Also, intra dinner is on patio. Uh, as we send you out, why don't you uh, put your hands out as if to receive a blessing. This is just to kind of take a posture of receiving. Uh, our bodies are often the ones that lead the way of our hearts. And so, Lord, Rock Harbor, would you know that God is carrying with you and carrying you through life? Would you know that God is with you and God has gone before you, that he loves you and even when you don't feel it, he is working. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.